Good evening. Um, so uh, my four, uh, is it four distinguished colleagues or five, uh, have talked about the production of public numbers. Uh, the session title is Regulation of Public Numbers. And underlying regulation, one might think, that there's a politics, so I will rechristen this session to end with the politics of public numbers, partly because that is the thing that I've been involved in studying now for a fairly long period of time, not focusing on the numbers. That is, I never was a historian or philosopher of statistics, never had any desire to be, but as a student of the politics of science and technology, um, I couldn't help bumping into the fact that numbers, public numbers, are among the most political things in the world. So borrowing a page from Sama's book, I will say five things about numbers, and public numbers in particular. The first thing is that numbers are powerful. So it's not only a matter of can we get them good, or what is a good number, but that if you want to move the world, one way to do it in modernity is to generate numbers, and we've seen endless examples of this. Theda Scotchpool, my colleague in sociology and politics at Harvard, wrote a magisterial book about the non-existence of the American welfare state protecting soldiers and mothers, and the central, um, one of the central arguments there is about um, the failure of sticky numbers to be produced to underlie uh, a welfare state compulsion in the US. Uh, we see it pretty much in every policy area where the US federal government involves itself that some kind of number making capacity goes hand in hand with the policy. Public education is one of those areas where the sheer uh, variety of uh, enumerations and performance measures has become uh, both deeply contested and incredibly pervasive. You could not imagine uh, America's anti-discrimination legislation without a backdrop of statistical production. So more or less, you know, wherever you see large-scale politics in the US, one focal point is the enumeration system. And even if you take something like the US census, you see uh, how much politics lies uh, back of um, the, um, the categories of the census. So that brings me to my second point about numbers, which is not only are they powerful, but almost as a corollary, they are political. Uh, the United States Congress, when it does not want to act on something, uh, knows very well. I mean, this is the, rem remember, this is the anti-science US Congress, but it knows enough science to know that when it wants to shut off policy or activism in an area, it shuts off the production of numbers in those areas. So there have been attempts to shut down the biological and geological surveys so as not to allow the production of numbers that would go to one of Summer's indicators, namely the state of the environment. Uh, there have been endless attempts to uh, ban research or not fund research that would produce numbers that are relevant to public health or to poverty. I mean, so the US Congress is deeply aware at its fingertips that the non-production of numbers uh, can be a tremendous asset if you want a government of inaction. And of course, the flip side is also right. And lest one think only about the United States, um, Stephen Harper's government tried to shut down the long-term, the long-form census, and it was restored by the Trudeau government, but the impetus there is a similar sort of thing. Get rid of the numbers, and you will have no basis then uh, for things like baseline measures and our directions up or down. Are there even directionalities? Uh, so numbers are profoundly pol political in that sense. Numbers are usually thought of as universal, mathematics, the universal science, but public numbers tend to be parochial. Uh, what do we choose to count and what do we not choose to count? It's interesting that in very recent uh, times, 
the Guardian, which I believe is a newspaper based in this country, though the, these days one doesn't know where anything is based, and I believe the Guardian has an offshore persona as well. But in any case, the Guardian has become the agent that counts uh, instances of police uh, violence resulting in deaths, a number that the police departments of the United States were not counting systematically. So you can now go on the Guardian's website and see what those numbers look like, but it was not a number that was being generated before. So why is it that it takes a voice from outside to generate a number about the US? And it suggests that there's something quite parochial and provincial about the kinds of numbers that we do generate and the kinds of numbers that we don't generate. And of course, the STS people in this audience will recognize that I'm making a methodological point here as well. That is not only should we be looking at the numbers we do generate, but the critique of the numbers we do generate often relates to the absence of the numbers that we don't generate and that therein lies of politics as well. It's interesting to me that uh, in the U UK, uh, bookmaking numbers enjoy such great uh, popularity. People, a, a friend of mine told me just yesterday uh, that she had managed to bet two pounds at a time when the going rate was 240 to one against Obama winning the presidency in the year 2008. Um, the fact that she bet two pounds says to me a great deal about British risk aversion. <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> these, are, these are numbers uh, that don't have the kind of transparency behind them that your office, for instance, Ed, is seeking. So why is it that some numbers that don't have transparency nevertheless command action in ways that some num numbers that do have a lot of transparency do? And one can look, for instance, at the polling, the sort of meta-polling industry that has sprung up around Nate Silver, you know, himself a kind of statistic, if you will, uh, where uh, uh, there is a demand, not coming out of regulation, but coming out of cultural uh, um, pressures of various sorts, for him to explain exactly the ways in which he weights his own sort of poll of polls type results when he predicts uh, who's going to win primaries or eventually elections as well. Uh, now, all of that brings us to the fourth point, which is that numbers are performative in a sense that is uh, known to STS people. This is, if you will, a refinement of the political argument. Why and how are numbers political? And performativity in the, that context, in our disciplinary context, in this, meaning, in, in this meeting, means not only that people actually, as Mary was suggesting, have to perform the numbers in order to get people on board with them, even making transparency is a kind of performance. But this is performativity in a different sense, that the numbers do not just reflect a world, they bring about the very world that they're presuming to reflect. And this has been shown in the work of people like Donald McKenzie with regard to the um, 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 the stock market crash of 2008 and the kinds of numbers that the credit derivatives were reflecting uh, that were promoting a certain view of a world that didn't actually exist. But I think in Summer's presentation, we saw uh, an attempt to build on the performativity of numbers because you had your five uh, key indicators, but then just in these presentations, we've heard that there are many other things we could be measuring. So why well-being and environment, where does something like development, which Mary was talking about, sit in relation to that? And what is the relationship of your five numbers to this elusive thing called the economy that also doesn't exist without the numbers? So in that sense, by generating certain styles and kinds of numbers, we're generating the worlds that we think we're occupying and setting the priorities and doing uh, the the policy, uh, uh, laying the foundations for the directions of policy in that kind of world. And then last but not least, my fifth point is that numbers are cultural. Uh, and this I became aware of in my very first cross-country studies of the way in which risks are being regulated and the very large differences across national cultures in the degree to which they think 
that risks and benefits need to be quantified, uh, whether publics believe that those kinds of numbers of risks and benefits are indeed good quantitative measures of the sorts of things that they want to buy into. Uh, the US, on the whole, has a greater penchant for trying to solve all kinds of problems by producing public numbers around them. That propensity has not been equally pronounced in many European countries, including actually this one, where the numbers are generated out of models. I mean, so for instance, American um, environmental regulation early on went into the business of producing uh, very refined risk statistics based on models that were surrogates for the thing actually being measured. So animal tests for toxicity, for instance, at a time when Britain was relying far more on epidemiology. But epidemiology depended on actually going out and counting the end point, the illness or the sickness that was manifesting itself, whereas the toxicological models that produced other sorts of numbers were saying, let's get in there before we actually have the bodies that we can count. So there are these cross-cultural differences which I think begin to matter in the kind of world that Mary was describing and actually the other, others of you also alluded to because there is this great standardizing impulse uh, present in the performativity of the Millennium Development Goals for sure, but also in things like now every country in the world is required to produce a GDP number, and Diane, you suggested that a great deal of standardization was needed in order to get these numbers such that a body like OECD or the UN can actually say these are comp comparable and commensurable numbers. But again, anybody who has looked into any regulatory structure deeply, like for instance, the forest cal forestry calculations under um, provisions of the uh, climate regime, uh, saying that you can do clean development by exchanging one kind of thing for another. I mean, you know, one immediately sees to what extent the numbers that are back of the policy actions are fictive, made up, you know, uh, illusory to some degree, uh, do, do not commensurate across different regions of the world. But nevertheless, we have this faith in them. So I think that parallel to all of the production of numbers, stories that we've heard that are profoundly interesting, we need to do the uptake reception politics of the numbers studies themselves. And until we do that, we won't solve the problem of trust because that trust is to some extent culturally embedded, attentive to the parochialness of the particular enumeration systems and political and powerful in ways that are marked in particular ways across the world. So thank you.